What we're going to do in this video, in two parts probably, is show the demise of repentance message in the church. How, how it came to pass that we've got down to this where repentance is just a mere confession of sins, or not even mentioned at all. And how that's tied into the myth of original sin. And how all that culminated together way back in ancient times and was handed down to us throughout the years, up through the Reformation and to modern times when all doctrine, evangelical, so called evangelical doctrine, has been developed. Now, without exception, repentance today, without exception, this is everywhere. This is, this is in the churches, the Sunday school classes, the vacation Bible schools, it's the missions. Uh, China, India, Africa, you name it. No matter where you look, without exception, everybody believes that forgiveness of sins can be had by praying a simple prayer to God, confessing your sinfulness, that's repentance, that's repentance to everybody, every preacher we've ever contacted, and receiving Jesus as your personal Savior into your heart. The entire church today, the entire evangelical world, from the Catholics included, of course they think grace is imparted by the sacraments, but we'll, we'll get to those things. They think that, that uh, their success is, or failure is measured against this, against this gospel. If people respond to the invitation, they're pronounced saved and forgiven of sins, taken into the church, and taught that God will someday clean them up and that they'll be able to live a better life than before, a new and improved version of the old life. You've heard me say it many times in the videos when we show them what the Bible teaches about repentance. The sin never really stops. It's supposed to stop in, in the process of repentance, the clearing, and the vindication. It's supposed to stop there in repentance, but it never does. And, of course, this includes all the sins and fornication, molestation, adultery, drunkenness, drug addiction, you name it. It's any, any sin. It doesn't make any difference. It never really stops. You learn uh, to cope with the sin. You sin less and less and serve more and more and do, do more and more for the Lord. But that's all in through an application of His grace because you were born a sinner. So no one questions this. Whether or not it's of a biblical perspective or taught in the Scriptures. They don't compare what's being done by the book of Acts. They compare the success against whatever somebody else is doing, if they have success. Even though nothing in the scriptures supports any of this stuff. The, the apostles didn't go about doing this. You can't find any support in the scripture about accepting or receiving Jesus as your personal savior or repeating some little prayer. There's nothing like that anywhere. In the scriptures, you got repentance so proven by deeds and faith working by love. That's, that's what it shows in the scriptures, basically, of the fundamental principles behind salvation. The fundamental principle behind faith in the scriptures is action. The fundamental principle behind faith in this in this type of preaching is trust. You trust that everything's been done. There's no action involved. Action would be equated as works, as we have shown many, many times. The works salvation, and it's not of works. They tell everybody, pound it into their heads, that they have nothing to do with their salvation. Man cannot attribute one iota of anything. So that throws the works of righteousness out the window. The works of faith, that faith worketh by love, that he obeyed from his heart, that he took up his cross, that he laid aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. All those things are thrown out the window. They become secondary to the salvation experience, not the primary aspect of salvation. So, there's no question then that this is what they teach. This applies to their revivals. The huge responses that they get, they consider that successful. They get the platform all lined up with the people, and uh, with move, they consider that a movement of God, whether they use music or worship teams or motivational speakers or just plain emotional hype, a, a great speaker that gets people all riled up. It's counted as God sending His Holy Spirit to rally the troops. Nothing happens. There's no godly sorrow for sin. There's nobody crying out to God for mercy. There's The tears that are brought about are brought about by this God is love message and He's going to forgive them in their sins and they can go home with their vile hearts feeling good about themselves. That's exactly how it happens. So n nobody comes to these meetings 
seeking to clear themselves of any wrongdoing, and nobody leaves the meeting seeking to clear themselves of any wrongdoing or make restitution for their sin. There's no zeal to do anything right for God or to do the right thing by faith because if you do anything, you're working for your salvation. So there's no faith working by love to purify the heart. The revival is successful in their estimation if everybody prayed the prayer, went home feeling warm and fuzzy about God, and the evangelist then, he thinks that he's triumphant and, and uh, he goes on his way, or his or her way, and he's got God anointing his message because church attendance increased. And they just keep it up. It just grinds and grinds on and on and on. And goes on that way everywhere all around the world. That's how they do it. They go into the little villages in India. They go into the villages in Africa. I've seen some of this stuff myself. And that's exactly how they present the gospel to these people. It doesn't matter if they come out of sin. It doesn't matter if they quit committing sexual immorality or living with, living with the... the uh, people they're not married to or running around with other women or other men or committing fornication it, it, none of it matters all that matters is you got a response it's getting further and further away from biblical standards and then every once in a while a new a new version of the old formula comes out from the churches from somebody you know like the purpose driven nonsense or somebody writes a book and then it's endorsed by all the celebrity preachers of the day, and everybody jumps on board. The market's flooded with the books and the tapes and the, and the tracks, the DVDs, all kinds of material, and it's all copywritten material. All trade, a lot of it is even trademarked. And it gives a resurgence in church membership and a big flurry. Even sometimes the media even does stories on this stuff. On, you'll see it on TV. And the local pastors then are going to get all excited about introducing these fresh concepts into their churches so they can get a reaction from the people. So all, the, all it is is the new format is just a, ver, a, a refreshed version of the old format. It's the same thing. It's the same message. Come in your sins. All based on instantaneous salvation and salvation without real repentance and apart from a genuine faith, a faith that is dead, the devil's faith. Nobody seems to care or try to restore the biblical purity to the message because that's too hard, that's too difficult. It's easier then to minister to the needs of the people and go about doing good in the works and the service, just like it says there in the book of Revelation about the one church, in Revelation 2.15, I think. And it says that you have the works and the service, but yet you tolerate all the, the fornication and the, and the sin. And it's easier to do that than to preach the repentance message. And to bring that out, and to bring people to a godly sorrow in a season of godly sorrow and a crisis of conviction, and bring them through that, cleared of their sin, and really renewed in Christ. So everybody has an opinion about this, and some people even recognize the dilemma that something's desperately wrong, and they run around and they, you know, they they try to remedy the situation by preaching a little bit stronger message, and and all that kind of thing. But nothing ever really changes, and the formulas remain. They don't attack the formula or the system itself. They just get around the edges and debate that, well, if we did this and we did that, this would change and that would change. You know, we see it in, in all these different type of evangelistic things that are going, the revival uh, teachings that go on. Salvation doesn't have anything to do with anybody coming out of sin. Nothing. And that's the central focus of the Scriptures. So the, the present day system then becomes a mess of confusing doctrines and religious rhetoric that people look on it, the non-believers out there, and it's a joke. You know, they look at the joke preachers on TV, the big celebrity guys with their hand out uh, asking for money and, and doing all the stupid crazy things. And, and to them that's Christianity. Nobody refutes any of this stuff. Nobody stands against it in the local church. They wouldn't stand against anything in the local church. That would be unpopular, and they would be afraid somebody wouldn't drop a $20 bill in their plate that week. But if what I want to do in this video is give some serious thought to how these things originated and how it all ties in to the demise of the repentance message and the conflict and the controversy that happened behind this. How did we arrive at this quandary? How did we arrive at this dilemma, let's say? It certainly wasn't something we learned out of the Bible. You know, an atheist could read the first few chapters of the book of Acts and see it has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on in the church today. Nothing. 
Nobody's repenting or coming out of sin, crying out to God. None of that's happening. We get people speaking in tongues and rolling on the floors, but not nobody's coming out of sin. But how did we get? How did we get then? The question remains. How did we get from repent and deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus and uh, He endures to the end will be saved and, and strive to enter through the narrow gate and put your hand to the plow and, and all the other... How did we get from that to confess your sinfulness, receive Jesus as your personal Savior, and God loves you? How did, how did we get to that? Did you ever wonder about that when you're sitting in those churches listening to that hogwash message every week? that makes you feel good, that's got your family deceived. Well, that's what we're going to try to look at here. It's going to be a long process of looking in some historical facts. This is not the usual type message that I usually preach. It'll be more like a lecture of what happened, but it all ties in to the demise of repentance. It all ties in. So I'm going to, I'm going to tie this all into. So, who decided then that the gospel that Christ preached, follow me and take up your cross, is not the gospel. Like Erwin Luther said, it was not the gospel. Who decided this? When did it happen? And who made all these non-biblical standards, these non-biblical methods that's being used, universal? That everybody's willing to face eternal judgment using these standards all around the world, pour all their money and millions of dollars into it, billions of dollars perhaps on such a flimsy base. How did it all happen? There's a great deal at stake if we answer these questions honestly in a fair. Your entire creed and confession, your doctrinal statement, your orthodoxy, your, your whole denomination is on the line here. Everything. I know this is not easy. To admit that you're in error would be tantamount to unconditional surrender in the time of war. You know how enemies don't want to unconditionally surrender. The same with you. The very core of your existence is founded on these things, on this original sin message. The whole of your doctrine is built on it. People have willingly given their lives for less of a cause than what I'm asking you to examine. With just a few simple questions that I just ask. So the reason this discussion is going to be so mystifying to most churchgoers is because it's so deeply rooted into ancient history that nobody really knows where to begin. They go back to the Reformation. They go back to the Reformers. Uh, they go back to uh, a little further. Uh, the pre nisan Fathers and the Fathers... They don't know where to start. See, But most people then are satisfied with just believing that somehow their denomination or their belief group is connected with the Apostles in some way and originated on apostolic doctrine. Even though we can look at history and put an exact date on the formation of every single evangelical denomination somewhere between 1500 and 1800. We can show that in history. None of them have their roots in apostolic Christianity, and that includes the Catholic Church, which claims, of course, that they do, being the Church of Rome. That was the, where the corruption began. So why does everybody think that that's, they have apostolic doctrine in their in their uh, teachings. We can basically prove it to them and verify it through hi hi historical research that it's not. That these things aren't really a matter of people's opinions or private interpretations. It has nothing to do with that. We're dealing with facts here. So we need to examine the facts outside the box. That's what you got to do. So you're going to have to come outside your denominational roots and background. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to see beyond the arguments of the theologians and the scholars and the people of your, the, the guys who come and talk to you in your, your churches with all their rhetoric and they sound so uh, authoritative and have so much credibility because they have a PhD in their name. So you're going to have to come out of the box to, under, to, to even begin this discussion. Understand also that you're always going to find a dissenting voice in the mix and whatever you look at in history because everybody has an axe to grind. So you've got to understand why, why, why they're saying what they're saying. Who's saying it and why they're saying it. Examine it objectively. It's impossible to do that. If you predetermine the outcome, it's already impossible. So you have to look at it objectively. 
not abandon the first principles of repentance and faith, but look at it in the purest form that it is. So that's our premise. Either we begin here, or we chuck it all out the window as a betrayal of the faith. So the first premise is the basic understanding that we need to agree upon is that during the apostolic period of the church, the preaching of the doctrine was pure and sound. The preaching, the preaching of repentance. It was handed down by Christ, by Christ himself to the holy prophets and the apostles, entrusted to the select group of men who wrote down most of what we consider our New Testament scripture. Now, unless we agree that Christianity began on the principle and the foundation of repentance, faith, and purity, we can't get anywhere. You might as well shut the tape off and, and walk away. That's where it began. It didn't begin on God is love and, and, and confess your sins and receive Jesus, okay? It didn't begin there. It's easily seen in the book of Acts. Also understand that the purpose of the doing this is not to give you some detailed account of church history that you can find in, in, in a multitude of books that you may even re have read already. It's going to include a lot of historical facts and dates and people that tie into all this, but only as it relates to the main subject of the demise of repentance and faith. So it's my intention to show you how the demise of this message in its purest form is the main reasons behind the great departure from the faith that we've seen over the centuries. When you realize then how far back this thing goes into ancient times and how it's affected the preaching of the gospel today, in our day, then you'll be able to recognize the real difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error in your churches instead of pretending that you recognize it. So the, so the instructions were simple in the beginning. The instructions were simple. Go forth into all nations, preaching repentance and faith, baptizing in the name of Jesus. From the beginning, from the beginning, when Jesus sent them out, the core of the message was to turn people from sin to God, from darkness to light, cleansed from the inside out, to follow Jesus' example, simplistic and powerful, unmistakably of God. As he said in Luke 24, 46 through 48, and he said to them, It is written, Thus it is necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and the remission of sins should be preached in his name, beginning in all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Repentance, first thing. Not just remission of sins. Repentance in remission of things. Repentance proven by deeds in remission of sins. That's how the gospel was presented. So, after the deaths of the apostles and their immediate disciples, the message then got confused in a mixture of pagan philosophies that were prevalent in the Roman Empire at the time. What began in the first 30 or 40 years of the, of the first century and spread throughout the ancient world like wildfire, as we see in the book of Acts, was extinguished about 417 A.D. in Rome. And it's in this time frame where I'll take you up to to show you this bitter controversy that took place that gave us the demise of the repentance message, the repentance and faith message. It, w it was a controversy between a British convert from Britannia, called Britannia at the time, that traveled down to Rome, that was a convert to Christianity, named Pelagius, and a Roman Catholic bishop in Rome that was very prestigious in his position at the time, Augustine. And it was over free will and infant baptism. Now Pelagius, when he came on the scene, was keenly aware that the pagan doctrine of the Manichaeans, the Manichaeans, uh, their, te their main teacher was called Mani, M-A-N-I. He regarded the nature of man to be corrupt, that the point to his will was powerless to obey. In other words, the sin was in the nature. See, sin, sin was in the nature. He was born with it, not the choice. Big difference. You've got to understand that. This Pelagian recognized that these Manichaean and the, and the Gnostics is the same thing. It's a combination of the Gnostic and the Manichaean teaching in the form uh, of a neo platonist teaching that was taught that, that, was, that Augustine was under. And it taught that sin was in the nature. In the nature. Not a choice. It wasn't a free and independent choice. 
Man did not have a free and independent choice when it came to sin. This is where this original sin originated. It's absolutely indisputable. Indisputable. It did not originate with the Jews. It did not originate in Christian teaching, which we'll show. So Augustine, he trained under this for many, many years before he converted to Christianity. And his conversion then was under, under this, we'll, we'll look at that again in, in, in another section here, but it was around 386 A.D. that he converted. Shortly after the Roman Emperor of that time decreed the death of all Manichaeans, and shortly before he declared Christianity as the only legitimate Roman religion. Now see, the, Constantine brought Christianity into the Roman Empire in 325, but it wasn't the only legitimate religion at that time until later on under a different emperor, 386. Then it became the Holy Roman Empire, as we know the Catholic, the Catholic Church to be. So this conversion then of Augustine was of necessity, not really of conviction of truth. And he never abandoned his Manichaean and Gnostic teachings. He just brought them into the church with him. And he had a huge influence. He became a major player in Rome as a, as a theologian and scholar, skilled in Latin literature as well as pagan beliefs, although he couldn't speak or read in Greek. He was the son of a Roman uh, pagan father and Catholic mother, and studied as a youth under these pagan philosophies under Cicero and Plato in their teachings. He was well known for his sexual escapades, which developed into a lifelong obsession with lust, which explains a lot why he uh, needed this as an excuse to sin, because he could never get victory over it. But his early, by his early 20s, he was teaching grammar in a school in Rome and pursuing a career in ancient philosophies. In 383, then, he moved to Rome and began to move among what he considered then uh, rubbing shoulders, so to speak, with, with the uh, brilliant minds of the times, the rhetoric, uh, the speech makers. So at 30 years old, through his Manichaean and Gnostic friends, he won the prestigious position as professor of rhetoric at Milan, which was very prestigious for a man of that age at the time. So this... In this, he got politi politically connected and became a respected scholar and began to write very prolifically. He continued to dabble in his pagan philosophies and take up with other women as opportunity to present itself. You can find that in evidence in the, in, the, in the past. Although his supposed conversion to Christianity is very much venerated as one of the greatest conversions of all time, almost to the point of legend in, in literature, it occurred merely as I related to you above, out of convenience. It wasn't anything to do with, with uh, a crisis of conviction or a season of godly sorrow or, or any, of that, any of that kind of thing. So out of this then he became a major player and a driving force behind the corruption of Bible doctrine that ex extends throughout church history to the present day because the reformers adopted totally Augustinian doctrine, not Pelagianism. Augustinian doctrine, which we'll show you. So the early church, that background given to you, and we'll go into more of that later, give you more details behind that. The early church was a collection of in-home churches established by a group of traveling evangelists in the ancient world, the, the apostles. And it lasted until about 325 A.D. When the New Testament speaks of the church in Corinth or the church in Rome or any other various city in the ancient world, it's talking about these in-home churches that were in existence. We see that in uh, Acts uh, 2 and 46, and Romans 16, 5, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, Colossians uh, 4, 15, Philemon uh, 1, Philemon just verse 2, there's only one chapter, of course. Persecution was commonplace in the Roman Empire from Nero to D Dominitin, which spanned uh, about the years 54 to 96. Of course, apostles perished, uh, perished before that, but they're immediate disciples. So by the end of the first century, we can say pretty much that the, the apostles were gone. The, ma the main number one apostle, including John, was gone into, into, the, into, the, into glory, and the church was in the hands of their immediate disciples. Now, according to the writings of these disciples, which you can still get your hands on in books and, and translated into English, 
the early church fathers. Now these are not the the the, the Nicene fathers. These are the pre-Nicene fathers, the disciples of the apostles. There's a big difference because there's a lot of heresy afterwards. These guys are Polycarp, Clement, Ignatius, Barnabas, and some others that wrote that wrote that wrote a lot of these things that we can get our hands on still today. They managed to keep the message of repentance and faith pure and contended earnestly for the faith against the onslaught of false doctrines coming out of the empire. They, they kept it pure that it was a matter of your behavior and conduct and you would endure to the end. And These guys didn't believe in no internal security. They didn't believe in none of this nonsense that's being preached today. You read what they taught, it's exactly in line with what Jesus said about the faith, about following Him, taking up your cross, enduring to the end. It, it, might as well be, it might as well be the Scriptures. But the forces of evil were hard at work to hinder the progress of that message. As the second century progressed, most of these disciples were either killed or disappeared from the scene. Like Polycarp, for example, he was burned at the stake. Rome slowly began then to gain its preeminence in the, and become the center of religious influence. And in the, in the bishops that were appointed, appoint, getting appointed started maneuvering for power and influence. Now, of course, Rome was, was the ancient city of the time, the New York City of the ancient world, right? So it naturally would become, it, it would gravitate to the fact that it would want to become the center of religious, religious leadership. So in 189 AD, an African bishop named Victor, some people call Victor the first, if you look it up, you saw him the first, first pope, but that's debatable. He gained ecclesiastical authority in Rome as the bishop. And he immediately then began to dis dispute and break away from some of the teachings of the apostles. One of his early departures from the apostolic teaching then was the controversy over the observance of Easter. You see how far back this goes? 189 AD? In accordance with the Gospel of John, the observance was held by the churches, the little in-home churches in the, in the disciples, on the 14th of the Jewish month of Nisan, which corresponds with the Jewish Passover which makes, makes all kinds of sense, because that's where Christianity originated. Victor wanted it moved to the following week, corresponding with the Roman calendar. The debate got so heated up with these guys, because the guy had no spirit of God in him, of course, he excommunicated anybody that would appear to the Apostle John and his disciple Polycarp, which carried the teaching on into the second century, because he lived until he was very old before they killed him. And he ex excommunicated all of them. And then he changed the, the reading of the Mass, you know, which that came about at this time too. There's no Mass in the Bible. In, in, the Roman, in the Roman collection of churches that were coming about, from Greek to Latin, and wrote theology in Latin, which was the sc scholarly language in Rome. Greek was the language of the people, Koine Greek. He remained in power until 199 AD, and like I say, the roots of Pope-like authority could be traced back to him. So the spirit of error then had gained a foothold in the early churches well into the second century. The debate took the focus off repentance and faith. It centered it around interpretations and manuscripts and speculative teachings about God and all this other stuff that pagan philosophies, the Arian controversy and all these other things kept injecting into it. So during this time, here now we have the Nicene fathers, the pre-Nicene fathers that came, again, the, the, the third, fourth generation, they introduced a lot of heresies and disputes into the church. That's where you'll find a lot of this stuff. And that's where all the scholars point to. They don't point back to Ignatius and Polycarp and Clement because those guys were teaching what Paul, Peter, and James taught, that you've got to obey God. So they ignore that stuff. They don't want nobody looking at that stuff. That would blow up their theology. So the disputes continued, and the church then began to take on more and more of an appearance of ecclesiastical hierarchy run by a group of hungry men, hungry for power and influence, rather than an evangelical movement that it was before, preaching Christ to a lost world. And you can find out a lot of this uh, by reading the early church uh, book by a, an old uh, preacher named Harry Chadwick from the 1800s. You can still get that book, too. So we set the stage for this. 
The supposed conversion of Christianity, then, of Roman Empire Constantine comes into play here as we approach in to, from the 2nd to the 3rd century. Now, we have to look at a little background with this to bring it into, into focus and how it all fits into the demise of repentance. So bear with the facts here. I know it's more like a lecture than, a, than preaching, but this, is, this all fits in, and you'll see why. So his conversion in the 3rd in the century marks a major turning point in church history. You can almost say that the 325, which is where the Council of Nicaea took place under Constantine, and we'll give you why it did and what happened there, is the major turning point in the history of the church. Now, he was the son, Constantine was the son of a Constantinus, a former military man of high position in Rome, who managed to get an appointment as, a, we'll call it, junior emperor. They called it Augustus in, in, uh, in that time, in the main, in the main Caesar. With, the main Caesar was called Augustus, and the junior emperors were called Caesars at the time because the Roman Empire was divided up in the east and the west. And out of that, there was four different uh, Caesars, uh, uh, junior emperors appointed. So he got an appointment to the Western Empire in 293 under a do, do, dominion. Uh, here, I'll write it down for you. It's D-I-O-L-E-C-T-I-A-N. He was the emperor. For which the, the he was he was the he was the the Augustus, the main guy. So as a member of the high court, then Augustine grew up in this, under under that court. He was schooled in ancient philosophies and had the benefit of a Roman education. He began early on serving in military campaigns and gained quite a fine reputation as a soldier in the Roman army as a result of that. And the many intrigues and stuff he witnessed in the courts of uh, Domin Dominican here is uh, the great persecution that broke out in 303 for the per of the Christians. He still wanted to persecute the Christians. So there was a big old persecution that broke out again in 303 and killed a bunch of people. So in 306, after various and brutal campaigns of conquest that uh, Constantine was involved in and risen to power through the ranks by this time, Constantine's father took sick and died suddenly, but not before he uh, appointed his son in his place which of course was against this guy's wishes. He did not wish that to be, because everybody had political rivals here, as, as you can imagine. You know, everybody, everybody is vying for power and influence in these empires. So, but Constantine, he took, he took control of the reins, and he maintained his power base in the West and expanded his borders, because he was such a good military man. He expanded his borders in Britain, Britannia, Gaul, which is modern-day Germany, in Germania, you know, which would be France and uh, Spain, all, all those places up in there that uh, became Europe. After he defeated the raiding armies of the Franks, which, you know, came out of that, those areas that always were invading northern Italy, he launched a major building campaign in, in uh, the Western Empire and issued more tolerant decrees about the Christians, end, ending a lot of those persecutions, at least in his, his portion of the empire. His military conquests, though, they continued in the West, and his political rivals then, they got more jealous. And they, you know, were moving to dislodge him from power. So that's where we get up to the rebellion that led to this so-called conversion of, of Constantine. This happened in 312, when his rival Max, Maximus led an army against his Constantine's eastern flank which was weakened by his deployment of troops along the Rhine up there in, the, in Germania, in you know, Gaul, to, to, to contain the Franks so they wouldn't keep in, uh, crossing over and invading and plundering villages. So Constantine, he couldn't with, risk withdrawing the bulk of his army off the Rhine and letting them guys come invading into the kingdom again. So, he, so to meet Max, Maximus's advance, he mustered his Praetorian Guard and Imperial Horse uh, Guard and some other troops that he had, about 40,000 men. He marched them across the Alps of Italy, and he prepared to meet Maximus' much larger force in a decisive battle that would decide the fate of the, of the empire, in, in his mind. You know, Maximus' force was about 100,000 or more. So it was a huge number difference here. 
He first encountered the Maximus's cavalry, heavy cavalry as they called it then, because they had them big spears and shields and all that. It was very awesome at the time. You might even have seen that in some of the movies. And he lured them into a trap, like one of the Roman traps, and surrounded them and, and got them in there, and they slaughtered them in the field. Then he quickly moved through northern Italy, and he met the bulk of Max, Max, Maximin's forces at the Battle of M Milan Bridge, outside of Rome. So, arrogantly, arrogantly con assuming that Constantine's army was no match to his superior forces, of course, he advanced from the fortifications, which probably was the fortifications of the strongly uh, fortified city of Rome at the time, and he met Constantine in the field. Big mistake. So as the myth is told about this, about this conversion, it helped him win that victory against his political rivals. So it led quickly then to the Council of Nicaea in 325 that he called together. It was attended by 220 bishops, basically, maybe a few more. Most of them were Greek. Began in May of 325. This is the beginning and the end for the preaching of repentance and faith, the true preaching of repentance and faith. The, the system of error that we've shown you time and time again was beginning to form at this time and take its shape, just like a, just, just like a, a, a ghostly figure beginning to appear. The issues that this council were taken up was uh, the Arian question, which is the heresy of ancient times, which I mentioned slightly there before. You can look that up online if you like. The celebration of the Passover, another schism in the church that was taking place. Uh, the Father and the Son, the early discussion of the Trinity, which they didn't call it that at the time. That didn't come about too much later. It, of course, that was identified, with the, of course, with the Arian issue of, as well, the concept of God. In the baptism of heretics, this question was that if people who denied Jesus in the time of persecution should be allowed to uh, retain their position of authority in the church, and if baptism executed by them and by heretics would be valid and have to be repeated. You know, stuff, stuff like nothing to do with repentance of sin. See, they thought baptism saved you. It was, uh, you know, that, that began right there. That, that baptism imparted the grace of God. It was baptismal regeneration to these. Not the baptism of repentance. They, they totally chucked that out the window at this time. So they adopted a creed, passed some measures ruling over the establishment of the authority in the churches. Nothing they debated or discussed had anything to do with refocusing the gospel message on repentance and faith. Back to the apostolic message. The creed that they came up with, which you can pull up online, in the Nicene Creed, you can take a look at it in its original form. It was basically their concept of God, the ruling centered around uh, ordination, Holy Communion, the reading of Mass. So the Catholic Church then, as we know it, was beginning to establish its authority and exercise that authority over the Roman Empire at the time. This is where it all began. That's why I say that's the turning point. That's why this, this thing with Constantine is so important to understand. He never really converted to Christianity, but he had a he had a, a serious effect on the outcome of things in 325. Even though he only lived till 3, 337, when he died, he left a huge power vacuum uh, among his surviving sons and daughters, which they immediately began brutally fighting for power, just like their father had done, uh, to see who was going to be in charge. Just like all oh, through the empire, empire was that kind of stuff was always happening. The rightful heir, his oldest son Crispus, he killed in 326 for alleged immorality. But there may have been other motives involved in that if you read the history behind it. You're not really too sure. So Constantine's impact on history, on the church history, cannot be ignored or passed over lightly here. He set the stage for the death of the gospel message, the corruption of that message starting here in the apostolic teaching going down the drain. And he set the stage then for the people to come in, for Augustine and, and that, uh, these people to come in, that have a perfect platform then, or which they could eradicate any opposition to that authority and establish what would become doctrine then for the next many thousands of years up through the Reformation. We'll make this the end of part one.